Hello everyone, we are back in uh, Com Research Methods. So today we are going to talk about how research is produced and then how it's communicated to the public and why it's extremely important that you understand how research is communicated to the public. Because if research is communicated to the public poorly, uh, the public gets a uh, inaccurate idea of what the research actually does. Um, so this gets, you know, this kind of crosses over a little bit into um, making sure that you are a uh, critical observer of media, how media can be manipulated a little bit, um, or how it can manipulate, manipulate you, uh, but really in terms of research. So uh, how do we make sure that we're using research in a, in a, in a really you know, fruitful way uh, we, where we are accurately uh, letting people know what is happening in research? Real quick, I'm gonna remind you of this a couple times, but down below I have three links uh, one of the links you've already seen, which is um, the APA formatting link, uh, but if you need to revisit it, please do. Uh, one link is a news clip. It's about a four-minute news clip I want you to watch on, uh, it has to do with Shakespeare, interestingly enough. And then the third one is an hour-long lecture about what's known as the replication crisis that's going on in the social sciences uh, and the idea of um, why is it that these various you know, social scientists find these like very cool results, uh, but nobody is able to replicate them. Uh, and it gets into some things like people are using bad methodology, people are cherry picking data, um, conclusions are being inaccurately reported. And so uh, you, you can't just find a conclusion one time and say that's the conclusion forever and always. A good experiment has to be able to be replicated by your peers. I, um, other scientists should be able to replicate your studies. And if they can't, there might be a problem with the original study. So that's what the third link talks about. And I'll mention those uh, throughout this video. When it comes to reviewing previous research, right? Research does not exist in a vacuum. We've talked about this before. Your research and your interest is not just about you, right? The way you get an interest in a subject and the way in which you start to compile your own research is based on the work of other people. So you always need to know what other people have done before you, and then what you do is you help push the research forward by filling voids. You find gaps in the research to, uh, you know, to hopefully sort of push the ball forward with regard to research, right? You don't need to go around reinventing the wheel, but you need to be very, very knowledgeable about all the research that came before you. So as I've mentioned before, you cannot write a, let's say a 10 page research paper uh, in an introduction class like this and have no citations. Scholarship is a conversation. The reason we cite other people's work is to let other people know that we have heard the conversation and now we are jumping into the conversation with knowledge about where the conversation is. Uh, so for instance, when you go on and get a master's degree and a PhD, a lot of getting a master's degree and a PhD is about understanding the history of your field, right? You have to be able to tell people, I understand what my field is. I am expert in my field. It's not that I'm gonna be an expert in something later on and I can do good research. That's important. But when it comes to being able to teach and accurately describe your field, you're saying, I know all of this material about my field because I read the work and I can cite it in the paper. And now I want to jump into the conversation in uh, 2021. And this is the new thing I have to add to the conversation, all right? So um, prior work provides a foundation uh, on which researchers will build sort of their new arguments in case. And just because you are building upon previous re research doesn't always mean that you agree with the research um, or that you don't find faults in it. There's plenty of times where I have cited people in my own work where I cite them to then in the next paragraph say, and I think they're wrong. I think their methods are wrong. This is why I think their conclusions are wrong. Let me reinterpret their data, right? So just because you are citing people doesn't mean you agree with them or um, yeah, you, you think that their conclusions are correct. But they're still, if they're an important pillar of the conversation, you need to cite them and understand their work, if nothing else, to be able to say, and I think they misinterpreted something. I think they had the wrong conclusion, right? So even cite people that you disagree with or who have a different argument than you. Uh, you cannot say anything intelligent until you have read the previous research, all right? So again, well, you know, stuff I've already discussed. So let's go through a few examples that I usually go through in class. Uh, so first one would be something like gun control. Um, is gun control good or bad? And by this, I mean, um, let's go to the extremes. 
full Second Amendment uh, support with regard to people who don't have, you know, a felony record should be able to buy any sort of firearm they want. Um, and the other extreme would be like, mm, we really, really restrict access to guns. You know, you have to do extensive background checks. Maybe you have to have training. Maybe it's only like former military and police officers are able to have access to guns. Nobody else gets guns, right? So you have this debate, guns good or guns bad, right? And the first question I would, you know, maybe ask in a classroom and kind of go through some of these things with students is, have you read the research about gun violence, right? And there is research on gun violence with regard to where it happens, how it happens. Um, does it happen in states with more gun control or less gun control? Uh, there's plenty of places in the United States that have almost like no restrictions on guns. Everybody's carrying guns everywhere and they're very, very safe. So you think about like sort of these wide open spaces like Wyoming, right? Um, there are places that are very strict with their gun control and, um, you know, there's a lot of violence. You think of something, a place like Chicago, right? So can you just sort of define and, and, and talk intelligently about the gun debate on both, you know, both perspectives? Um, when I teach my public speaking class and I have students give a persuasive speech, they usually have to use three main points. One of their main points has to be a counter argument because they have to be able to show me I read someone I disagree with. I, I might in the next point tell you why I think they're incorrect, but at least I understand their side of the argument. Um, some other things, you know, with the issue of like, uh, you know, with this issue of gun violence, I might go through definitions, right? Um, so nothing, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, nothing bothers me more in a, in a good old gun debate um, on the news when you have people who come out on the news and discuss um, gun control issues and they don't know proper definitions with regard to basic, uh, you know, uh, firearm use um, and safety protocols, right? So things like, do you know the difference between a semi-automatic and an automatic weapon? Uh, do you know the difference between a clip and a magazine? Uh, can you even properly define what an assault rifle is? Um, you know, what, what makes a rifle an assault rifle, right? So you have that qualifier. Um, you know, these are like very basic definitions that the people who are creating these laws, politicians, should know the difference. Uh, and what you, you know, if you're, if you're knowledgeable about, um, firearms, it, it's very obvious that a lot of people who are sort of making these, uh, or are having these discussions, uh, don't know a lot. Right. And it's not to say that, you know, the policy is good or bad, or the policy should be one way or another, but it's to say, it's like, you should just know what you're talking about before you get on TV and start talking about it. Okay. Um, let's jump down here to, uh, president Obama real quick, uh, just to go in chronological order. A few years ago, um, several years ago now, uh, President Obama signed what was known as the Affordable Care Act. It's also known as Obamacare. It's the same thing. Um, and back when that was sort of the conversation uh, uh, in, in politics, um, I had students in my class who liked it, who didn't like it. And the first question I would ask them is, like, have you read it? And they, most of them say no, right? That's an unacceptable answer for a researcher who is going to write a paper as to whether or not the Affordable Care Act is good or bad. All right. Now, I, I think it's reasonable that most, you know, people in the public uh, don't read lengthy pieces of legislation. Um, but again, if you are a researcher and this is going to be your topic of expertise and you are going to stand up in an academic setting and say the Affordable Care Act is good or the Affordable Care Act is bad, you should have read it. All right. Full stop. Um, just a couple years ago, the big fun debate in class, uh, President Trump signed what was known as the travel ban. Um, some people started calling it the Muslim ban, um, which, you know, as a rhetorician who's really, you know, keen on details and semantics, and I think like these small little tweaks matter, um, I disagreed with that use, right, regardless of intent. Um, but again, we did the same thing in class. How many people like President Trump's uh, travel ban? And some people were like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. How many people don't like it? And people were like, oh, it's a terrible idea. And then my first follow-up question is, have you read it? And everyone's like, no, I haven't read it. And I'm like, it's, you know, it's like a page and a half long, right? So again, most of the general public hasn't read it. I don't really blame them. But if you are going to be a researcher or if you're going to get on television and talk about it um, with regard to, you know, news, like you should be a person who has read it. So if I had a new show, which I would never get, um, and someone wanted to come on to talk about a certain law that was put into effect, uh, the first question I would ask them would not be like, what do you think about this law? The first question I would ask them is like, okay, you're gonna come on here and talk about Donald Trump's uh, travel ban. Have you read it, sir? 
And if they said no, I was like, all right, let's get off my news program and let's go to the next guest. Um, because those people on TV are giving out um, narrative changing opinions, right? They shape the larger conversations that happen in our communities. And if those people are just as ignorant on the details of the legislation as the rest of us, uh, I don't want them forming the conversation. I want, you know, very sort of super nerds who sit around and just read legislation all day uh, and show up on C-SPAN. I want those to be the, those, those individuals to be the ones who actually tell me exactly what is in uh, either the travel ban or the Affordable Care Act. Um, right now we're going through uh, Donald Trump's second impeachment. It's in the uh, Senate right now. Um, I want those people to tell me like, most people you talk to, you know, you say like, why is Donald Trump being impeached? Most of them might have an idea, but it's like you haven't actually read the papers, right? Because there's very specific details in the impeachment papers that have nothing to do with uh, what most people are talking about, right? Um, as far as the impeachment process. So I'd want, to, I'd want someone in there who is an excellent scholar on impeachment and has actually read the impeachment documents um, to give me opinions. Right, about things like incitement of violence, about First Amendment, about sedition, um, insurrections. I want I want those individuals who can speak intelligently about it, not someone who just says, you know, Donald Trump's a blowhard and we don't like him. Um, you know, it's a fair opinion, but uh, not good for scholarly conversations. Uh, the final one, and this is going to be your first clip down below uh, for the YouTube stuff. Um, so make sure that you watch this clip below. Um, there's some UCLA English students a couple years back, uh, I've talked about this in other classes, uh, who have made this petition and this push, and I believe it's enacted now, where if you're getting a degree at UCLA in English, uh, Shakespeare is no longer a requirement. So it used to be you had these core classes, right, and one of them was like Shakespeare, right, and then you have all these electives. Um, a couple years ago, some English students uh, at UCLA said Shakespeare shouldn't be a requirement anymore. Um, and there's a couple problems with that. The first problem is, is that students aren't the experts. Faculty, you know, students go to faculty and the faculty are the ones who should be setting the parameters for the curriculum. Um, so that's number one, right? If you're going to college, uh, the assumption is that you don't need to, you, you don't know what it is that you need to know with regard to getting a degree. That's why you're going to professors uh, and asking them, um, you know, tell me what I need to take to be an expert at this subject. If you knew everything you needed to take, you wouldn't need to go to college in the first place, right? So that's the first problem. The second problem, I think this is the more important problem. Uh, and this is the question I would ask all these students who say like, we don't wanna read Shakespeare anymore. First question I would ask them is like, have you read Shakespeare? Uh, and if your their answer is no, which my assumption is probably no, just because of their youth, not because of, of any sort of ignorance. Um, but yeah, most people aren't reading Shakespeare until college. Maybe you read Romeo and Juliet in high school, but most people aren't really getting into like Macbeth right, uh, until, until college. Um, yeah, if, if you haven't read it yet, you cannot intelligently tell me whether or not you should or shouldn't have to read it, whether or not it, it has, um, whether or not it is important or not important, right? So you first have to read something and then tell me whether or not it has something important to say uh, in the year 2021, for instance, all right? So that's, a big problem with people saying things like, I don't want to read Shakespeare. So down below, um, just in full disclosure, this is a clip I came across. Uh, it actually just ran last night. Um, it's from Fox News, so it is political, right? There's some political jabs in there, but just watch the first four minutes of it. Um, and the commentator talks about sort of, it just sort of, he, he, he lays out all the ways in which Shakespeare has been influential, right? Um, so there's a lot of things that just sort of happen in pop culture today, references, um, titles of songs, themes of movies that are all Shakespearean, like directly Shakespearean, right? It's not a stretch. Um, and he sort of lays out like, here's all the ways Shakespeare has been important, but most people don't know that because most people haven't read Shakespeare. People just assume that all of these new things in pop culture, oh, it's so new, it's so original. It's like, no, it's been around for hundreds of years. We just don't, we forget about that because we're not being taught Shakespeare. Uh, another example I give of this sort of phenomenon is uh, when I talk to students about like the, the Western canon or the academic canon and um, you know reading old religious texts, so the Bible particularly, uh, there's this really good book called The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, who's an atheist and very, very outspoken. Uh, you might say militant. 
uh, he writes this book called The God Delusion, and there's this very big section in that book where he talks about how he encourages people to read the Bible, even though he's an atheist. But he says, I encourage people to read the Bible because, well, he says it for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is he says is that there's so many stories and themes and phrases that we use in uh, in language today, in our stories today, that are directly from the Bible. So he's like, if you want to understand the culture around you, he's like, you have to read the Bible because the Bible has influenced so much of where culture is today, right? So again, even though he's an atheist, he's like, yeah, you should still read the Bible to better understand the world around us today because the Bible has been foundational in shaping us today. Same thing is true with Shakespeare. You can't say, I don't want to read Shakespeare because it's old. You should read Shakespeare and then make, oh my gosh, so much of our world, as far as the stories that we're telling and the music that we listen to and the themes, like it's been influenced by Shakespeare and you should know that. And you would never know that if you're going to be an English student at UCLA who says, we don't want to read Shakespeare anymore. Well, how, how do you know where this whole sort of like history of language came from if you don't read these sort of uh, very pinnacle important figures who have shaped it along the way? Shakespeare being one of them, right? So make sure you watch this, just watch the first four minutes. I think the second four minutes is more political stuff. Um, so, but, you know, watch the first four minutes just to kind of see all these ways in which Shakespeare has uh, influenced culture. Places we have stored knowledge. So uh, a couple places I want to talk about. The first uh, down by my head right here is the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Um, this stored the, the history of the world, right? Um, it was destroyed a couple times. One was accidental fires. Other times, you know, new tyrants would come in and they would want to get rid of all the books of the people who came before them because they wanted history to start the day that they took power, right? So this is what a lot of people do. They say, you know, when I'm in charge, I'm going to get rid of all of the books that disagree with me uh, so that people don't know anything different, right? Um, the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799. You all probably know the language learning program Rosetta Stone is where it comes from. What the Rosetta Stone is over here in the top right, it's a combination of Greek and Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, and this was a way in which people were able to start to decipher. So we knew Greek. We didn't really know Egyptian that well as far as like researchers uh, with, with old hieroglyphics. But because this stone had depictions of both, people were able to sort of walk things out of um, Egyptian into the Greek language. And it's like, oh, we know Greek. And so now we can translate into English, Spanish, French, you know, other romantic languages. All right. Um, so the Rosetta Stone sort of helped us to decipher older languages because it had multiple translations on there. All right. Uh, finally, just for fun, uh, this crystal skull, you might have seen the uh, um, Indiana Jones stuff. It had claims that it was sort of like pre-Columbian, which means before Columbus got here. Um, so uh, Native Americans, specifically down in South America, uh, Central America, claim, you know, claims that they had this special power for cultivating knowledge. It was found to be a fraud in the 1800s. Um, but right, there's all. Long story short, what this is all about is that there are epistemological, right? Epistemolo epistemology. We've discussed history of like how do we know what we know? Once we know these, like where do we store these things, right? And these are various places where we've sort of looked for answers or tried to store our accumulation of knowledge, right? Types of research, right? There's primary research and there's secondary research. Uh, why is it important not to base your opinion on news coverage or what you find on the internet? And this is why. Primary research is the first reporting of the research. So you go to the actual article, the actual research that was written, you are reading the words of the actual researcher. Secondary research, and this is why it's important not to always listen to, or not to always take the news uh, for face value, right? Dig a little deeper. What secondary research is, it's somebody else's summary. A lot of your textbooks are like this, right? Textbooks aren't original research. Textbooks are summaries of the field, and they use sort of um, important pieces of research that have happened within the field, right? But also TVs, magazines, internets, et cetera. This is a problem because let's say you have a 30 page document that lays out research, a news segment might only devote 30 seconds to it. And so they sort of cherry pick interesting points, but they don't contextualize them or they don't get down to the final conclusion and the limitations where the researchers talk about the uh, scope right, of, of their research and how their research might be a little bit shaky, how they need to do more work. So news reports of research can be grossly misstated 
um, depending on which part of, let's say, a 30-page document uh, the news decides to uh, discuss, uh, to, to report on. Um, you know, I've done a few interviews on some of the research I've, I've done, and, you know, they read the entire paper, and they might pick out one phrase, um, and it makes me look, let's say it makes me look bad, and I'm like, oh, no, that doesn't, that doesn't, out of context, that looks really bad, but what the reader doesn't know is that in the second paragraph, I actually qualify it, or I actually say, you know, here's some reasons we should be skeptical, or I know I said that, you know, here's some facts, but we need to put these facts in context, and I do that in the second paragraph, but maybe the original, uh, the, 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 the secondary reporting doesn't really put that in context, right? So it's almost, it's, it's like Twitter. Uh, that's what news reporting is. Um, they give you a headline. It's like, no, I, I, I didn't mean it that way. I tweeted out one little sentence, but there's all this other context around it that people don't understand through Twitter because they don't know what your intent is or your motivations. So research requires a lot of context. And when you just get something just from a quick news story, you lose a lot of that context around the research. So let's show you what this might look like. Um, here's some various examples. You can look these up uh, of ways in which research has been inaccurately reported by the news. Uh, one, one of the more famous ones is like, there's this Mozart effect where it's like, you know, when your baby's in the womb or like once you have a baby, you know, make it listen to Mozart all the time, it's gonna be a genius. Uh, and people are like, that's a bunch of garbage, right? That's not true. That's not how this, that's not how babies work. Um, however, that's what gets reported because there's like a small little sentence in one longer research paper about, you know, how babies learn things. Um, okay, so here's a fun little cartoon about how science, the new cycle of science works, right? So you do some research and you're like, A is correlated. And we've talked about the difference between correlation and causation. A is correlated with B, which means they move in the same direction, but they probably aren't causing each other. You go, you go your university PR people, right? And it's like, they found a potential link between A and B. And it's like, well, that's true. There's a potential link, uh, uh, link, but I didn't say they're causal. I just said they're correlated. They might be linked together, but we don't know yet. All right. All right. Now you go to the newswire. A causes B. And you're like, uh-oh, that's not what I said. But they sort of were kind of evolving the language along. All right. Uh, then we get to the internet. Science are trying to kill us again, right? Then you get to, you know, like a fake CNN kind of here, like, right, you know, A causes B all the time. And you're like, that's not what I said, right? Um, finally, you know, what you don't know about A could kill you, right? Uh, and then I'll finally you get all the way back to your grandma here, right? And it's like, I'm wearing this hat to ward off A, right? That's kind of how it works, right? It's a this long game of telephone, of secondary conversations, uh, secondary sources, where you're just like, hey, there's this really interesting relationship between A and B. I don't really know if they're connected or if it's relevant. But you tell someone and they don't understand how research works and they think, oh my gosh, this is sort of like rolling down the hill uh, faster and faster. And like A is important all the time. And you're like, no, like it's just a small little thing that's kind of works in tangent with B. Um, but this is how the news cycle works. All right. So you want to be very careful when you're doing your own research to go to the original journal studies as opposed to reading secondary studies. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why it tells you, you know, Stay off the internet with regard to like CNN.com, Fox News, MSNBC. Like, don't look for research there. Uh, it's not because those places are inaccurate or they're fake news. It's just that um, they might be missing context. Um, there's plenty of instances where news stories, like they report something immediately, and then the next day they kind of, they, they offer some clarification or some retractions. Uh, they clean up their stories a little bit. You know, journalism is known as sort of the first draft of history. It's like, it is the first draft. Like, you should go there because it's important to know, to keep up with the daily events. But it's not the final draft, all right? And the same is true with this sort of stuff going on with science. It takes a long time for science to kind of pan itself out. You want to go to the original sources. Scholarship, you need to know this. Peer-reviewed and blind review, all right? This is where the APA link is going to be down below. So watch the APA link, all right? Peer review. What that means is, like, I write a paper and then I send it off to a journal to get published. I do a bunch of research. And if it's peer reviewed, it, and all, all journal articles are gonna be peer reviewed and blind reviewed. The peer review part means that other people within my field are going to read my paper before it's published. So if I'm an expert on, you know, uh, let's say uh, babies and Mozart, right? If I'm an expert on that, I write up a paper about the brain development of children I send that paper out and other people who are also experts on brain development in children are going to read my article before it's published and they're going to give me feedback. 
Sometimes it's as few as four or five. Um, I've had manuscripts where sometimes it's as many as 12 to 15. Right? When I published my book, for instance, you know, 12 to 15 other people had read it right, to give me some feedback on it. That means peer review. Other experts in the field are reading it. Blind review means that you take your name off the paper so that personal biases can be avoided. Now, political ideological biases might still exist. So if I reach a conclusion that you don't like, people are like, I might not want that conclusion. But let's say that you and I don't like each other and we're both experts on, you know, baby brains, right? Blind review means I take my name off the paper so that when you read my paper, you don't say like, oh, I really hate Josh. I never want him to get published or have any sort of credit. I take my name off the paper so when you read the paper, you just read it for whether or not it's good research, right? And if it's good research and it gets published, you might say like, ah, I can't believe Josh wrote that paper. I don't like him, but that was good research, all right? Um, or if you and I are really friendly, I send out my paper, it might be bad research. And if you see my name on it, you're like, oh, I like Josh, I want him to get published. That'd be very nice of me. Um, but you don't want that to happen. You want good research to get published, all right? So you take the names off of things, um, the editor. So I give my paper to, let's say, Joe. Joe's the editor of a magazine or a, a journal. And then he's gonna send it to you after he takes my name off of it. He's gonna come to you and say, hey, can you read this? It's a it's an article I got from another scholar. I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but just read it and tell me whether or not it should be published in this journal. Um, APA formats uh, information is down below. We've talked about it before. Watch the video if you haven't. But scholarship, as far as academic scholarship, if you're an undergrad, know these three places where scholarship is located and you are gonna do fine. Journal articles are found on the online database for Penn State. They are not internet sources. What used to happen is there used to be things that's called microfilm and they would be stored in the library on these little like canisters, like film, right? And each of these little squares is basically a, like a big like newspaper print or a page out of a book uh, or academic journal. These just take up a lot of space, right? Um, so what they started to do is they just started putting them on the library's website to save space. These are scholarly and peer reviewed. If you go to Penn State, you type in a topic, you get scholarly peer reviewed, journal articles will pop up. They are located on a library database, but they're not internet sources. They're PDF scans of actual in print text. Uh, book chapters in an edited book. So one book might have an editor on the front and then each chapter is written by a different academic. Um, so that's what a chapter in an edited book is. And then a book is the entire book is written by the person who's listed on the cover. All right. More details down below in the APA discussion. But if you know how to use these three sources and cite these three sources, 95% of your undergrad career is going to be covered and like 75% of your grad school career. When you order a research paper, this is real basic. Um, it's not always gonna look like this, but for our purposes as an undergrad, learn how to do it this way, and then later on you can you know, modify it if you want. Uh, but when you order a research paper, research papers, uh, a full one's gonna be about 20 to 25 pages when you go to grad school, right? 7,000 to 10,000 words, all right? Um, you're gonna have a title page, then you're gonna have an abstract, then you're gonna have an introduction that's about two pages long, all right? This is where you have a rationale, like why is it that I need to conduct this research? After this, you have a literature review, right? And what the literature review is, is we'll get more in the next, on the next slide, but a literature review is all of the work that has come before your work. So you summarize about 10 to 15 sources that are talking about the work you want to do research on. It's gonna end with a research question or a hypothesis. And what you're saying is that the literature has done all these things, but now I'm gonna tell you where the gaps in the research are. And the rest of my paper, the, the next 15 pages of my paper are going to elaborate and I'm gonna to try to add to the conversation. So literature review summarizes all the literature that's already about that topic in about five pages. And then you say, for the next 15 pages, I'm gonna tell you what else we need to explore in this topic that hasn't been discussed yet. For a couple of pages, you're gonna have what's called a theory or a method section. You're gonna tell us how you're gonna look at the problem, how you're gonna collect data, right? Um, we'll talk more about that later. Then you have the results. The results are the bulk of your paper, maybe like 10 pages. Say, after I did my research, this is what happened. And this is unbiased. So just tell me exactly what happened. I don't want to know your opinion on it yet. Just say, this is what I found. When I dug into this topic a little bit more, here's what I found. In your discussion, you could also call this your conclusion. This is where you interpret the results. 
you give me some of your opinion. Do you think this is good? Do you think this is bad? You tell me the limitations. Limitations are um, ways in which your study falls short. So it's like, ooh, I, I overlooked this problem. Here's something that popped up I didn't think I would see before. Then you tell me where future research should go. What should your next paper be about? Um, and then finally, you have your references. So this is kind of how a basic sort of like, you know, graduate school 101 uh, paper is going to be, be laid out for the first couple papers you try with regard to uh, research. All right. And finally, we're going to talk about literature reviews because you're going to have to write a literature review for your first paper. All right. A literature review. All right. And we'll go in more detail later. But a literature review, you do not summarize one piece of scholarship at a time. Some people say, like, here's 10 books. I'm going to summarize a book for one page, two page. And then you know, a literature review is organize it by topics. So you get 10 books together and then you're kind of doing 10 to 15 book reports all at once. So topically, you might say, I'm going to do poverty. So this is what my dissertation was on. All right. I do poverty. Okay. Poverty as a uh, systemic failure of public policy. Okay. There might be three or four sources in there for about a paragraph. Poverty caused by drug addiction. Okay. Now there's three or four sources in that. Poverty caused by a uh, job loss in a certain geographical area. The factory shut down, right? You might have three or four sources in that section. So that's what a literature review is. You divide your five pages into about five or six different, you read through all the books and then you notice that these all 15 of these books have common themes throughout them, common topics. Okay, what are those topics? And I'm gonna arrange my literature. I'm gonna talk, talk about topic one. And in topic one, I'm gonna cite three or four sources that I found. Topic two, I'm gonna cite three or four sources that I found, right? So you're organizing by topics. You're not organizing by book one, book two, book three, book four. All right. We'll talk more about literature reviews uh, later, but again, this is a way to say here is the totality of the conversation. And when we talk about homelessness, we talk about job loss. There's conversation about drug addiction. There's conversations about mental health. There's conversations about systemic failures around welfare policy, right? Um, there's conversations about whatever. All right. So that's how you organize a literature review. You are telling people all of the things that are currently being talked about in your topic. And then you move on to, and here's the new conversation that I would like to have uh, that we have failed to have thus far in the conversation on homelessness. All right, that's today. Uh, watch the three clips below, and I will see you all next time.